Okay, so welcome again. We are talking today about romantic love. Uh, you remember we talked about uh, Christian love in the Middle Ages. Then we talked about the love towards God. Then we talked about how this uh, was transformed into courtly love. And now we have arrived at the point where we want to see how this turns slowly into the modern conception of romantic love. Uh, and it is always good to look at literary examples. Um, we look at Romeo and Juliet in this case. Um, you remember, um, uh, perhaps you know this. Uh, if you don't know it, I tell you briefly what it is about. It's Shakespeare's play. Romeo and Juliet are two children, and they are children of enemy families. So the families are in a war with each other, two powerful families, and the children now. Uh, fall in love with each other when they meet uh, and now they have a problem because their families are enemies and the children are not supposed to be together. Uh, they are secretly married uh, by a friendly priest uh, but in a series of fights and duels for which there are various reasons that are explained in the play Romeo is forced to kill a cousin of Juliet. So now this makes things worse because now Romeo himself is in war with the other family and because the other family is powerful, as a consequence, he is exiled from his city, Verona. Juliet's parents decide to marry her off to someone else. Now, because this is romantic love, obviously Juliet doesn't want this. Um, so in order to avoid that, she drinks a poison, which is not really a poison that will kill her. It is a medicine that will appear to kill her for 42 hours, um, like a powerful anesthetic or something like this. She will be in a coma, but she will not be dead. Uh, and then she will wake up again and she will be fine. She sends a messenger to Romeo to tell him about that, but the messenger doesn't reach him. And Romeo, therefore, comes to see Juliet. He hears that she is dead. She, he goes to see her. She finds her dead, and he believes this because he doesn't know that this is just a medicine that makes her look like she is dead. And therefore, he is um, he, he commits suicide himself at her grave because he doesn't want to live without her. Uh, and now Juliet awakens after these 42 hours. She finds her lover dead at her feet. And so she kills herself too, this time for real. Right? It's a tragedy. So in the end, everybody is dead. So now, how is this story different from courtly love? How is it similar? Do you see the essential elements of romantic love in that? So first, the love is more equal, mutual, less one-sided, and idealizing only Juliet. So this is not the case here, right? Here, both of them are in love in a kind of symmetrical way. It is a love that seeks sexual fulfillment as opposed to the distance in courtly love, right? In courtly love, you clearly have this distance um, where the point is to idolize someone from, from a distance without actually uh, engaging with them. Here, both of them want the sexual fulfillment. They want to meet. They want to be in bed together. Uh, neither Romer nor Juliet can tolerate that the other might get married to another person. For a courtly couple, this would not have been such a great problem, right? Obviously, uh, courtly love was all about uh, being the boyfriend of someone who is married. Mm. Not here. They don't accept being married off to somebody else. And um, but, but it has some similarities to the Tristan and his old story. Uh, they also don't want to give up their sexual love and accept Isolde's marriage to the king. So there are echoes in some of the courtly stories of this exclusivity, but it is not the usual thing. So there is an ambiguity here about the exact role of sexuality and abstinence from it in courtly love. As opposed to courtly love, romantic love is clearly sexual with the intention of the lovers to unite in every way, including sexually. Okay, so you see that this already is different from courtly love, right? It has characteristics that are much more modern, that we recognize much better. 
as a love story of our times and this is why this is still uh, one of the love stories that is at the basis of many love movies you know they are made um, based on this basic premise another classic of love literature is Shakespeare's sonnets of which we, we just have a short look at one of them um, here you see the thing in uh, its original form you can take a moment to have a look at it perhaps stop the video here and have a look at that if you like uh, because I we will not read that one um, um, this is difficult to understand the English of it we will look at a translation into modern English uh, in a second okay so here it is in modern English Shall I compare you to a summer's day? You are more lovely and more moderate. Harsh winds disturb the delicate buds of May, and summer does not last long enough. Sometimes the sun is too hot, and its golden face is often dimmed by clouds. So here are um, the things that on a summer's day are still bad a summer's day is fragile the clouds can come uh, there can be harsh winds um, but all this is not the case with a lover therefore the lover is even better than a summer's day all beautiful things eventually become less beautiful either by the experiences of life or by the passing of time but and now now it comes your eternal beauty won't fade and how is this? If this is a real love story, then of course your beauty will fade. You will also grow old. But now remember Plato. This is a platonic element here, right? This is almost exactly what, what Plato says uh, in the Symposium. Your eternal beauty won't fade, nor lose any of its quality. You will never die because you will live on in my enduring poetry, right? So the poetry will elevate this love affair it will lift it out of its uh, mortality it will and, and this uh, beloved will never age because she has been immortalized in this poem as long as there are people alive to read poems this sonnet will live and you will live in it right so this is a very platonic approach to love uh, who cares if we age what doesn't age is this thing that I have produced here. So another thing to notice here is the use of nature images, right? You remember last time already we said that romantic love has to do with nature. Uh, comparison with the, of the beloved with the beauty of nature and overcoming death, um, which is also the motive in Tristan Isolde and Abelard Eloy's stories. But there it was overcoming death by dying so the love overcomes death because we hope that it continues after the death of the people so they have to die in order for their love to overcome death uh, here the death is overcome through poetry which is this very platonic concept okay let's uh, look at a few more examples of romanticism in literature and art the romantic movement is um, something that went on at around the 19th century 18th 19th century um, and here we have Novalis a German writer and again you see that this is uh, very much emphasizing the emotions and it's also always emphasizing nature images through the cloud i saw the glorified face of my beloved in her eyes eternity reposed uh, the tears became a sparkling bond that could not be broken uh, on her neck I welcomed the new life with ecstatic tears again so the tears are an exaggerated uh, uh, expression of these feelings which reminds you a little of the courtly love I, if you don't react I will die right so it is similar here is this exaggerated uh, emotional aspect of it uh, and uh, th there is um, unchangeable faith in the heaven of the night and its light the beloved so the beloved is the light in the night right 
Um, so this is again this exalted version of the beloved. This is almost courtly here, right? Um, like God, the eternal light, uh, the beloved. A much more um, realistic or naturalistic description of uh, an affair we find in Wuthering Heights. You perhaps know this too. Um, Catherine speaks here, my love for Linton, Linton is the husband whom she doesn't really want it to have, uh, is like the foliage in the woods. Time will change it, I'm well aware, as winter changes the trees, right, aging. But now in contrast to the aging of the normal love, my love for Heathcliff, his, he's the real romantic love of her, resembles the internal rocks beneath a source of little visible delight but necessary. Nelly, she says to her um, servant, I am Heathcliff, my lover, I am my lover. He is always, always in my mind, not as a pleasure, any more that I am always a pleasure to myself, but as my own being. Right? So this is interesting what happens here. She identifies with him to such an extent that she doesn't need him to be a pleasure anymore. He is herself. And as she is not always a pleasure to herself, therefore he doesn't need to be pleasurable. He is herself. So this is the union, the ultimate union, the merging of, of these two people, or uh, Singer would say still the wedding, right? But the wedding in the sense, in, in a very extreme, to a very high extent, so that you perceive the other person just as yourself. Um, it goes on, be with me always, take any form, drive me mad, only do not leave me in this abyss where I cannot find you. Uh, I cannot live without my life, I cannot live without my soul, and because the other person is my life and my soul, I cannot live without them. So you see the desire for union and also how the speaker identifies with the beloved as her own being, not a different being. But like in courtly romances, the lovers here can be united only after death. It is not possible to fully unite with another living person, right? You cannot overcome the, the limits of the body. Um, another um, approach we have in Schelling, who was um, a German philosopher, uh, he wrote Nature Philosophy, Natur Philosophy, uh, where he imagined that the whole universe is created as an act of God's love, and what we see in nature is this loving presence of God. By loving, human beings themselves can experience unity with the universe. So the this is this is almost the mystical element that the mystics had, right? You you go in ecstasis, you you go out of yourself, you stand out of yourself. By going out of yourself, you experience the unity with everything. This reminds you of something of these um, uh, mystics who said that when I am with God, I am. Uh, the sea, I am the waves of the sea, I, I fly over the landscape with the wind, I am the wind, I am the spring, right? So the identity of oneself with everything else by going out of yourself. Love is therefore the force that keeps universe together. Um, the universe together, right? And, and we can experience the unity with the universe through love. Shelley, uh, English poet, uh, 1792 to 1822, uh, wrote an essay on love, which uh, goes, and in a few parts of it, a few sentences of it go like this. This is love. This is the bond and the permission which connects not only man with man, but with, e with everything which exists. So this is the same thought like just before. Right? Uh, love is a connection between different parts of the universe, not only to other men, but to everything. We dimly see within our intellectual nature a miniature, as it were, of our entire self. Yet deprived of all that we condemn or despise, the ideal prototype of everything excellent and lovely that we are capable of, that we are capable of conceiving as belonging to the nature of man. 
So this is a you know complex sentence. What it says, if we look without within us, we see a miniature of our entire self, but without all things that are bad. So I see in myself, Plato would say, the platonic form of myself. I see myself as perfect. And in solitude, now we continue here in solitude, or in that deserted state when we are surrounded by human beings and yet they sympathize not with us, we love the flowers, the grass, the waters and the sky. So when we are among other humans who don't love us, right? When, when we are with other humans who love us, then we have a human love relationship. But if we are with indifferent humans, then we, we just can escape this company and we can find love in nature. We can find love in flowers, grass, waters and the sky. In the motion of the very leaves of spring, in the blue air, there is then found a secret correspondence with our heart. Our heart being this perfect version of ourselves that is inside us. So we have this perfect thing inside us, the platonic form, and this corresponds in some mystical way with the perfection of things outside. Uh, we can perhaps understand it in a fully platonic way. There is this world of forms in which all things are perfect <coughs> and the poet has access to that in a way uh, by being able to perceive in solitude without other humans both the perfect form within himself and the perfection of the things outside. And these are united by love. Love is what makes us able to perceive these things. So the love of nature is a kind of our love for our ideal selves. Our ideal selves are these eternal forms, a miniature of our entire self deprived of all that we condemn or despise without all the bad things. In nature we find this perfection that we cannot easily find in human company in the deserted states when we are surrounded by human beings and they not sympathize with us then we still can access nature. Love connects us to everything that exists and everything that is good, right? It is the love of the whole universe, not a personal love. In this way, the romantic idea goes back to Plato in a much stronger way than courtly love did. In courtly love, we idealized this one person, but this one person was somebody particular. Uh, you remember that the point of Plato was that we don't stick to one person. We see perfection everywhere in, in this realm of forms. And this is much closer now, right? The going out of the person and going into the nature. Okay, so um, let, us, let us briefly summarize what it is about the Romantics. Um, Singer has a summary of the points that he thinks define the Romantic movement. Uh, emphasize the importance of emotion over rationality. Right? We saw this already. Uh, Coleridge, deep thinking is attainable only by a man of deep feeling. So this is very much opposed to today. Today we have this idea that science is what does deep thinking, philosophers. And, and what is the best science? What is the best philosophy? Analytic philosophy, analytic science. Uh, to analyze everything with logic. And through logic and technology to make mankind better to, to achieve better insights but here and and to reduce the feeling because the feelings are treacherous right Kant distrusted the feeling in morality um, and and we distrust feelings we want objective measurements right but here in the romantic movement you have the opposite deep thinking is attainable only by a man of deep feeling so the feeling is what what is at the root of your love for nature and your love for nature makes you able to understand nature in a deeper way and think about it in a deeper way. William Blake says, human imagination is the faculty that reveals God's own creativity. It is the means by which the world becomes a unity instead of a system of unrelated objects. Through the imagination we participate in God's being as the creator of such unity. We thereby identify with him, with nature and with all men and women. 
So there is a link between God's creativity that creates the universe and humans' creativity, the creativity of the artist, because the Romantic movement was a movement of artists who, through their own creativity, felt godlike in their ability to participate in the creation. Blending and merging is the mode of romantic identification instead of wedding. Uh, Schlegel says romantic poetry is literature that perceives the cosmos as all in all at one at the same time. At one and the same time. All in all at one at the same time. Right? So at the same time everything is everything else. The limits between things are erased. This is an ecstatic position again, right? Ecstatic. Novalis idealizes the poet who blends himself with all the creatures of nature, one might say, feels his, himself into them. So the act of love is an, an act of merging of the human with the nature around. Shelley again in a poem says, I am not yours, I am part of you. And this is the same what we saw in the Wuthering Heights. Uh, Heights. Uh, he's more myself than I am. Whatever our souls are made of, his and mine are the same. Right? So the, the complete identification with another person. This returns to Platonic merging, but now is not the absolute beauty of Plato, nor the god of Christians, nor the lady of the troubadours, but all nature is the object of such merging in the romantic, poetic view of the world. Is the romantic love appraisal or bestowal love? This, of course, is difficult to say, right? On the one hand, it's platonic, meaning that it responds to and idealizes properties of the beloved. It, it responds to beauty, it responds to kindness. This would make it appraisal love. On the other hand, in the Wuthering Heights, what we saw, Nelly, I am Heathcliff. He's always, always in my mind, not as a pleasure, any more than I am always a pleasure to myself, but as my own being. So here she does not appreciate particular qualities of the beloved. She's not appraising Heathcliff has blonde hair and nice nails and, you know, he's kind and so on. He's not even a pleasure to her. She She's not pleased by him. She is, she says, uh, not as a pleasure any more than I'm always a pleasure to myself. So he has all these faults that I perceive in myself, but I have to love him anyway. So in this way, uh, she's not appraising. She's just bestowing love. She's just saying whatever he does, it's good. I have to love him. Also, when romantic love is extended to all of nature, obviously you cannot speak of an appraisal anymore, right? If if I appraise one tree, I can do that. I can say this tree is particularly beautiful. It has beautiful leaves. It has uh, sweet fruits. It, it smells beautifully and so on. But if I extend it to all of nature, I include this tree and that tree and every other tree and then all the grasses and all the animals and all the spiders and all the cockroaches, then of course it's not appraisal anymore, right? It becomes bestowal. All of nature... It must be indifferent to me in terms of appraisal. If I love everyone because they are parts of God's nature, then my love has essentially become an unconditional agape. Right? In this way, the Romantic movement begins with the courtly appraisal of the qualities of the beloved, but it moves through um, an extended version of Platonic love towards a love of nature, which becomes more and more unconditional and ends up being agape, right? It synthesizes the two. Um, and in its ideal form, then, it's as um, romantic poetry, it becomes an unconditional love, right? The last thing we need to note about the uh, romantic movement is that it has an element of revolt. Uh, it is revolutionary. Uh, and why is it revolutionary? Because we can see that Catherine decides to love someone who is totally unsuitable by the usual social standards. Romeo and Juliet are drawn to each other although their families are enemies. And in the eyes of society, they are unsuitable partners. The same with Abelard and Eloise. They, she, she is um, not, she is her, his student. She is not the right object of his love. This is the difference to 
courtly love, which was for the most part accepted. It was well behaved, it was within the limits of the social convention of the time. Romantic love breaks these conventions. And this is typical of romantic love. If you look at movies, whenever you have romantic love in, in movies or literature, uh, most of the time it will be love that is against society's conventions. And this is what proves its strength, right? So I give you some examples now, Rose and Jack in Titanic, for example. Homosexual love in Brokeback Mountain, Beauty and the Beast, Made in Manhattan, if you have seen the movie, Pretty Woman, Notting Hill, right? These are all movies, uh, older movies admittedly, because, you know, I'm 50, I don't know much newer movies, um, but I'm, I'm sure you will know if you're younger. So these, but in these movies, it's always the mismatch between lovers. They are lovers from different social um uh, areas, right, groups, uh, circles, and they're not supposed to be together. There's something bad about these matches. And uh, love overcomes this difference, it overcomes this badness because it is so strong and this is what makes it revolutionary. So while appraisal orients itself around given systems of values, bestowal negates or ignores these values. Instead, it confers private value that is distinguished by not being identical with a given accepted values. And proper love is therefore romantic, in that its bestowal creates private value, possibly opposed to valuing norms of society. By being opposed in this way, loves become conscious of itself and affirms itself. Okay. So let's stop here. This is the general introduction to romantic love. And now we will continue. Next time we will talk about whether romantic love is the result of historical developments or whether it is um, uh, independent of, of society's historical development. Perhaps it's based on, on biology and some um, imperatives of our gen genes, right, and, and natural evolution. Okay. So see you in a moment for the next part of this.